Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Brian Baptist Church for this, our Wednesday night service. So glad to have each and every one of you here. You know, this is such a strange dichotomy. I have, uh, I have sometimes seen where Northside Baptist Church absolutely trounces and obliterates the attendance of Southside Baptist Church. But I'll tell you what, I mean, it's amazing on the other side of the Mason-Dixon line today, Southside Baptist Church, you guys are doing something this time. And so uh, that's it. Uh, don't begin flying different flags, though. Don't do that. So anyway, we're going to stand. Brother Carl is going to lead us in a song right now. Brother Carl. Okay, number 195, 195, glory to his name. Let's stand, please. <clears throat> Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of blood. Glory to his name. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. the blood of life. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory wonderful singing. By the way, thank you for coming because Northside Baptist Church was feeling really lonely. And so anyway, glad to have you here. Uh, you know, well, I'll, what I'll have to do, I'll have a special class with you folks on how to recru recruit people in the North. Yeah. I'll do that. And so glad to have you here. A beautiful day today. Uh, I don't mind the rain. After having so many heat waves and such hot and dry, I don't mind the rain at all. It's a little surprising. Uh, Caleb and I are going, it's me and Mar weather. Um, uh, uh, Craig is saying my old Kentucky home. It says it feels like Kentucky right now. So anyway, uh, glad that you folks are here tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. Ask God's blessing on the service. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come into your house tonight and that we can learn of you. And Lord, um, we did not have the opportunity to be one of the 12. We didn't have the opportunity uh, to walk uh, um, step with step uh, with Jesus on this earth. Uh, but we're still your followers. Yes. And we're still certainly in school. And we need to learn. And so I pray that you would help us tonight uh, to once again be your students and that you would teach us something new about yourself and how we should be. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're seated, Brother Carl's going to lead us in another song. Number 222, 222. 
I sing the mighty power of God. Amen. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day, the moon that changed I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and turned pronounced him good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed wherever I turn my eye. If thy servant Arise and tempest blow, but order from thy throne. While all that borrows life from thee is ever in thy care, and everywhere that man can be, thou God art present there. singing about the mighty power of God and um, just watching this afternoon these uh, these thunderclouds just you know pop up from nowhere and really way high in the sky from where we are and I'm just amazed uh, what God can do and just uh, having a chance to see that wonder and that creation is there anyone who needs a bulletin you do not have a bulletin yet this month just checking We'll make sure you get one if you don't have one, just double checking. Looks like we are doing okay on that. Um, I'm gonna start by saying this, please be in prayer for every employee of the Pendleton flour mill. Um, please be in prayer, terrible fire. Um, it started uh, yesterday afternoon, it was a small fire. They thought they got it out, they didn't pay much attention. And about uh, 4.30 this morning, uh, it went up like a, it just went up like a flare. And once that fire gets into the grain silos, it's, it's all over. There's no way to stop it. And so anyway, just be in prayer. We don't know what's going to happen, but that affects uh, hundreds of employees. And so we just need to remember them in our prayers if we would. Schedule-wise, let me say this. Faith Bible Institute elective class, this is your last class. This is 6.30 tomorrow night again biblical creationism uh, versus evolution it has been stunning and enlightening and um, i think the thing that has stunned me so much is um, the oppositions of science falsely so called mm -hmm. it, it is it is it is so false it breaks every rule of what science is every rule of science is broken by it uh, it is literally a work of complete fiction. Uh, but there's too many people that are invested in it, people that hate God are invested in it, and people that make money are invested in it. Um, almost sounds like climate change. Um, and so anyway, so you, you deal with all these things, and, and um, it's, a, it's a house of cards. Uh, but, but people don't know that. There's such great ignorance. And you see, when I went through school, it was articulated as the theory of evolution. They no longer use the word theory. They don't call it the law of evolution because they can't call it a law because it is not a law, it's hardly a theory. And so now they just call it evolution. You know, they just uh, act as if it's assumed reality. 
and there's absolutely nothing true about it. But it's been a wonderful class. Uh, so to the students here, understand this. This is your last class at 6.30. Then two weeks from tomorrow, you will have a final exam at 6 o'clock. And the only homework that you have is really to reread your entire workbook and then study from the study list that they've provided for you. But it's just a lot of information, wonderful information. And then one week from tomorrow, um, another semester of Faith Bible Institute starts. And that'll start at 6.30. It'll be pushed to 7 the next Thursday just because of that final exam. But normally, it'll be held at 6.30. There is a little bit of a changing of the guard taking place. Uh, Brother Carl came to me earlier in the year and said, uh, said, Pastor, you got too much going on. Would you mind if I kind of stepped in and became director of that? And I went, um, let me think about it. Yes. And so anyway, um, and so he's going to be helping in that capacity. I'm really grateful uh, that he is. Uh, looking at Friday, uh, roofing cleanup on Friday, if you can help. Uh, that'll be 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, uh, Caleb does what every construction worker does. He makes, he makes a mess. They all do. Every contractor, every construction worker, they make a mess. And so he needs somebody to clean up after him. And Abigail says, I'm not going to clean up after that. And so anyway, um, at 9 o'clock, if any of you can help, it would be very, very helpful. The good news is by that time, the scrap roofing will dry up after all the heavy rain we had. And so just letting you know that that is going on. Um, in great wisdom, Caleb looked at his app and said, my app says there's going to be rain on Tuesday. And so he tar papered new um, everything that was torn off. That turned out to be an incredibly wise decision because we've had quite a bit of rain. More good news. The, the city of Pendleton at first said, okay, we're doing this and you need to have a plan review, but I've been in steady communication with the building inspector. And the building inspector said, they told you what? And he said, you don't need a plan review. All you're doing is re-roofing. And so, um, so I got an email today say, checks in the mail, some of your money's being sent back to you. And so that's always good. Always like to hear that happen. And not only that, and, and not only that we're, we're approved now to continue until final inspection. And so anyway, some good things. So there's nothing to slow us down except for rain. And so anyway, we're grateful for that. So just letting you know those are going on. Um, Saturday, soul winning at 10 o'clock. That's after, of course, men have prayer and coffee at 8.30. And uh, Pastor Mike Mutchler is going to be with us. And you are going to enjoy him. I think he's been here one time before, uh, Miss, uh, Pastor Mutchler. I don't remember if he spoke, though. I think it was just Mrs. Mutchler who spoke to the ladies. Say what? I can't hear you. Okay, he has spoken once here already. Okay, very, very good. And so anyway, uh, glad he's coming back. He'll be speaking in Sunday school, be speaking in the Sunday morning service, he and his wife, uh, uh, Mrs. Mutchler, Vicki Mutchler, will be here. And so grateful for that and uh, letting you know that. And um, I want you, uh, parents again of the Homeschool Association, uh, we have a meeting, it'll be Friday, August 19th at 6 p.m. So just a reminder um, that that is taking place. And so I just wanna let you know of uh, those things that are, that are taking place. And at this time, Brother Carl is gonna lead us in another song. Okay, number nine, number nine. God can do anything but fail, amen? Let's all stand, please. We'll go through it twice. God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. He can save, He can keep, He can cleanse any will. God can do anything but fail. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Oh, God can do anything, anything, 
Anything God can do, anything but fail. God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. He can save, He can keep, He can cleanse, and He will. God can do anything but fail. Praise the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. Amen. And I am so grateful there is that one thing that God cannot do. And I'm grateful for what God does. Please turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke tonight, the book of Luke, looking in chapter 17 tonight, looking at the book of Luke. This is such an entertaining service. Was it a praying mantis? Brother Bob, welcome to the club. I am so excited for you. Okay, do I need to tell my praying mantis story now? Okay, I had one try to go to church with me about five, six years ago. Five, six years ago, I was harvesting tomatoes. I don't know what you're doing, Brother Bob, trying to harvest tomatoes. And I had on my green short sleeve shirt. And green is the color of a praying mantis. And so anyway, I went in there, I got out, I got into my gray car, you remember the gray car, I went to back up, I turned my head, I'm getting ready to back up, there's a four-inch praying mantis on my shoulder right there. <laughs> okay, I, um, I am sorry, but all of a sudden I did not feel the peace of God in my heart. And, uh, and, and I'll tell you what, very first thing I tried to do is I tried to get out of my car. I mean, I opened the door, I tried to get, I couldn't get out, I just built it in. And so then I'm wrestling to unbelt my seatbelt, and when I did that, I let go of the brake on the car. Has anybody seen my driveway? Okay, so anyway, I'm unbuckling my seatbelt, and all of a sudden, I notice that the concrete of the driveway on both sides of me is going flip, flip, I mean, it's going by fast, and I realize, and I picture myself becoming a front ornament inside the house of my neighbor across the street and so i mean i sl and the, i mean the meantime the praying mantis he's looking around like this going hey what's the problem we are going to church i am a praying mantis and um anyway um i uh, i got out of the car and i did similar to what you did there bob i sent the praying mantis to the praying mantis hereafter oh you didn't okay well i did I did. I sent him to the praying mantis hereafter, and I got scolded by Sharon. She said, shame on you. Those are good bugs. They do good things, uh, but not on my shoulder. But anyway, and, uh, but anyway Brother Bob, I, I suddenly feel such fellowship with you, just suddenly like that. Shared experiences. And okay, Luke chapter 17 now that the commotion has cleared, <laughs> and uh, we are going to, uh, for those of you watching live stream, you just have to be here. It just has to be like that. Luke 17, looking at verse 7. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by when he has come in from the field, go and sit down to meet? And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself and serve me. Till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant, because he did the things that were commanded him? It says, I trow not, which means I think not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are 
unprofitable servants, we have done that which was our duty to do. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to look in to your truth and help us to see it with new eyes. And help me to communicate what you have shown me. And pray, I pray, Lord, that not only would it, of course, help me, but that it would help all of us that are here. Help us to know who you are. Help us to understand who we're not. And help us to understand the connection we have with you as your servants by your choice. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I did an amazing thing on Monday. That amazing thing that I did on Monday was I mowed my lawn. I had not done that for a while. Um, I had been busy doing other things, and I was getting ready to do other things, and uh, Mrs. Watkins looked at me, and she looked at the yard, and she looked at me. I went, I get it, okay? Um, she said, it's one thing to have a lawn. It's one thing to have a yard. It's another thing to have a jungle. Let's, uh, let's do something about this. And so I mowed the lawn. Some sections, it was like bucking hay, so it took a little while to do it. But sometimes when I'm mowing the lawn, um, it, it's, it's not like I really have to tell the lawnmower what to do. It's you know, partly self-propelled. It's going to cut the grass. I don't need to, tell to cut the grass. And so my brain is free to think of other things. And uh, sometimes when that happens, God will just start giving me scriptural phrases and just running them around in my head over and over and over again. And uh, this was one of those phrases that was running over and over again. Because, to, to be honest with you, this verse has bugged me for years. Yeah, it's, it's bugged me. It's bugged me, and I've tried to, and I've looked at it, and, uh, and I've tried to, to wrap my mind around it and to be able to get from a point A to point B with it. And um, it's an interesting, it's a very, very interesting statement. Jesus is saying, say this. And so I go, okay, that sounds good. So all together, we all have the verse. I want you to say what Jesus told us to say. We're going to start at we are unprofitable students. So servants, are you ready? On a one count of three, one, two, three. We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Whew, I'm glad that's over. I see here we should say it. And, and you know when you look and go, okay, Jesus says for us to say that, and it, it sounds humble. And so it is really, really good humble speak to actually say those words. We don't really believe that, do we? It is easy to have a church full of activity. And it is just as easy for that same church to be completely void of profitability. Because profitability is in the spiritual realm. That's often the realm we cannot see. The title of the message, it's a little complicated, big-worded, but the title of the message is The Imperative of the Unprofitable. The Imperative of the Unprofitable. And it means literally God's command regarding unprofitability. And I want us to really kind of weigh these things out. Because I know you want to be profitable. And I want to be profitable. But we can't. That's hard to accept. We're going to look at three points regarding what God says about this. First of all, let me, let me state the obvious in the first point. It is in man's nature 
to consider himself profitable. It's in man's nature. It starts when they're little babies. And I mean, and I know this is putting, the, this is putting everything on the bottom floor here. But it starts with babies and you're trying to train them to use their diaper properly. Or actually, you're trying to train them to not use their diaper at all. That's what you're really trying to do, is train them not to use their diaper at all and whatever incentive there is. And you know, when your child actually begins to use their diaper properly, meaning they're not using their diaper, and begins to use the commode properly while not using their diaper, very often the child will look at you and the child will look at the commode and go, look what I did. That never changes, by the way, all through adulthood. It never changes. It changes in that way. We don't do that anymore. But it doesn't change is that there's a natural tendency for us to go, look what I did. You know, if we built something, look what I did. If we dug a hole in the ground, look what I did. If we made this nice frilly thing, that's for the ladies, not the guys, look what I did. I mean, it's just the nature, it is in man's nature to consider himself profitable. Because of that, Abraham actually did not let somebody do something that they wanted to do because he knew the nature of man. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 14. Book of Genesis, looking at chapter 14, and there's a king who wanted to reward Abraham because, I mean, Abraham, he rescued a whole bunch of kings that were being held captive. He helped them fight a war, and he, and he helped them in a great way. But look at Genesis 14, verse 21. We have a king that wants to reward him. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. He's saying, I want you to have a reward from me. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread, even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should say, I have made Abram rich. And so literally he says, I'm not going to let you do anything for me, because if I do, you're going to go all around hither and yon and the entire countryside, and you're going to say, look what I did. It's in man's nature to do that. And if it's not, look what I did, it's look who I am. Somebody a long time ago, I don't remember who it was, said people become the president of the United States for two reasons. One is to be somebody, or the other is to do something. It's kind of an irony when you think about it. One of them, it's look what I did. And the other one is look who I am. Very interesting. So those are the two. Look with me at Isaiah chapter 39. Isaiah chapter 39, verse, verses 1 and 2. And there was a king, and he had been sick, and he had got better, and he was feeling pretty good. And uh, some folks had heard that they were sick. They came from a distant country. He didn't know much about the country. Now, one of the keys about foreign relations is you kind of need to know what's going on around the world. So let's just say this particular king wasn't a foreign relations specialist. At that time, Merodach Baladan, king of Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he had been sick and was recovered. And Hezekiah was glad of them and showed them the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices, and the precious ointment, and all the house of his armor, and all that was found in his treasures. 
There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. It is in man's nature to consider himself profitable. Look what I did, or in the case of Hezekiah, look who I am. I'm a king. Look at everything I have. Look at the scope of my kingdom. Now, sometimes that can get really, really extreme. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 4, verse 29. Daniel chapter 4 and looking at verse 29. Ah, this is another king. Uh, you might have heard of him. Um, a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar became a look what I did and look who I am on absolute steroids. Verse 29 at the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? So sometimes it can get really extreme, right? Right? I think we need to understand it is in man's nature to consider himself profitable. This brings me to point number two. When a servant considers himself profitable, all sorts of problems occur. So stop and think about this. One of the problems is this. I'm profitable. Did you notice? I'm profitable. Did you see how profitable I am? I think somebody should notice how profitable I am. In fact, I'm a little bit irritated because somebody doesn't realize how profitable I am and I'm profitable so I think what I need to do is begin telling others how profitable I am because if I don't tell them they won't notice you see when a servant considers himself profitable all sorts of problems occur and as I was wheeling this verse at the beginning, over and over and over and over again in my mind, all of a sudden a little light bulb went off. And I went, if we become profitable, we're in trouble, especially since God says we're not. So here's some of the problems. Look with me at Galatians chapter 6, verse 3. Book of Galatians chapter 6 looking at verse 3. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. So what that means is that if I look in the mirror and I've decided I'm profitable, I can get a distorted view of what I really am. I can get a distorted view. I could begin to think more than what I am. And with that, you know, I feel a little bit of guilt because I remember I've told you I have this little box in the garage that says keepsakes. She says it's junk. I say it's keepsakes. She's right, but I can't seem to let go of them. And in that box are seventh and eighth place ribbons from an all-comers track meet when I was only 11 or 12 years old. What's the purpose of keeping those? It's kind of like, look what I did. Of course, now that I'm older, I go, and I didn't do very good, but I still have them. 
can get a distorted view. But then this also can happen. You can get, we can get an overestimated idea of our own power. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, looking at verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And we sometimes can get an overestimated view of our own spiritual power in our own lives and our own, um, our own sense of spiritual success and spiritual accomplishment. We can sometimes think that we've done more and we've had more victories because of our own profitability. Or how about this? This even comes. How about indignation? Look with me. James chapter 1, looking at verse 19. James 1, verse 19, it says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And sometimes we get a head of steam on ourselves and we go, I have righteous indignation over something. And God says from heaven, nah, that's unrighteous indignation. Because, and the reason we get righteously indignant is because we go, we're profitable. Or how about this? This happens. And, and here is really one of the common illustrations found in Scripture. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, looking at verse 3. And the Scripture says, For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying, of course, envying being jealousy, and strife, strife being conflict, divisions being factions. Are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? And what can happen if we consider ourselves profitable? Then there's a factioned mindset. Well, you have to understand, I'm with these people over here because these are the profitable people. These are the winners. These are the right people. You don't want to be with these people over here. These are the people over here that they're just a bubble off of plum. Of course, they think those folks are over there. Because, you know, we're in the profitable group. We came from the profitable people. No, we're the profitable group. And this is our hero. Our hero is this, Mr. Bapto something. And so, no, our hero is over here. This is Brother Bapto something. Ooh, let's get a little more personal. I'm from Berean Baptist Church. We're the profitable church. This is the place where something's going on. Oh, really? Who gets the credit for that? It's in man's nature to consider himself profitable. Hard to avoid. Confession of sin. I was pretty proud of myself the first year we had the men's chili cook-off, and I won. You think, you were proud you are a prophet. No, I just surprised I could even cook. It's in man's nature to consider himself profitable. Of course, the profitability isn't what went in the mouth. The profitability is what happened an hour or two later. I have no idea about that. 
When a servant considers himself profitable, all sorts of problems can occur. This brings us to the third point. And this is where we have to get to in the spiritual realm. And it's hard to get there. Every ounce of profitability is from God with Christ. Every ounce of it. Let's look at Romans chapter 3, verse 25. Romans chapter 3, looking at verse 25. And this is dealing with our salvation. This is kind of dealing with the very first step. Romans 3, verse 25 whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Of course, the forbearance of God is dealing with God's mercy. The propitiation is dealing with the payment of Jesus Christ through the blood of Christ. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And this is understanding what salvation is, that salvation is because of God's mercy, and salvation is because of Christ's payment, and salvation is because of Christ's grace. And so then it asks the simple question, where is boasting then? The boasting is look at what I did or even look who I am. It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. That's interesting. This is just dealing with salvation. We're born again believers in Jesus Christ. But as we interact with the world, do we go to the world and say, look who I am? Or is it, look whose I am? Because that's really where it's at. And you know what the amazing thing is? When it comes to whose I am, I couldn't do anything to, regarding whose I am. All I could do is accept the gift of eternal life by faith. I couldn't earn my salvation. So it really isn't who I am at all. It's whose I am. Who do I belong to? It really comes down to a very simple dividing line. I'm a sinner who belongs to Jesus Christ. Another person's a sinner who doesn't belong to Jesus Christ. All they have to do is make a decision and then they can be a sinner who belongs to Jesus Christ. Our salvation is entirely a work of God. Secondly, John 15, verse 5. Book of John, chapter 15, looking at verse 5. I am so grateful that this verse is in here because it puts everything in so much perspective where Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. You know, sometimes we'll read quickly through this, but I think what Jesus is trying to get through here is, guess who the vine is? You're not the vine. I'm not the branch. How many people have you met that they have that perspective in reverse? They think they're the vine and Jesus is the branch, and because Jesus is the branch, I, hey, listen, you're the branch. Um, uh, Lord, this is Jimmy. Gimme, gimme, gimme. You know, you're supposed to do whatever I want you to do, okay? Listen, I, I have a career path, and you're supposed to rubber stamp that career path because I am the vine, you're the branch. Rubber stamp that. By the way, that was me as a teenager. That's the way I was. I thought God was just supposed to rubber stamp everything I did because I blessed him so much that I received Christ as my personal Savior, so he's just supposed to say yes to everything I wanted to do. Within reason, you know. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. 
And that is maybe the hardest thing to understand. And that is whatever we do, even in ministry, whether we preach or we teach or we sing or we encourage or we serve, if we do it in our own profitability, nothing happens at all. And this is the thing. Without Christ, we are as useful as a severed limb. Now, very often, now Jesus talks about it like the branch is cut off. I kind of like the term severed limb because I can pretty much figure that if somebody cut off my arm, that, um, that this hand isn't really going to be doing much any more profitable. Now, it's not going to be writing anything. It wouldn't write anything anyway. I'm left-handed. But... Um, it's not going to write anything, not going to catch anything. It's not going to cut anything like with scissors because believe it or not, I'm really strange. I cut with right-handed scissors even though I'm left-handed. I am an odd person. No amens. Save for later. Without Christ, we're as useful as the severed limb. It's really true. And then... Thirdly is this. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. We looked at part of this already, but the Apostle Paul does more than get after the church and say, listen, you guys have become faction. You're thinking about who your hero is. You're thinking about who you are. You're doing all this glory seeking. And then Paul puts it in perspective. He says, who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed even as the Lord gave to every man. And the word minister means we're just servants. We're servants. We brought a message because we were told to, and you believe. I have planted, Apollos watered. But without that third part, what would happen? Nothing would happen. God gave, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything. Neither he that watereth, you can put in parentheses, anything. But God that giveth the increase. This is the imperative of the unprofitable. If God is truly going to be able to use us to do anything, we have to come to the point, not that we say we can't do anything without him, but we actually believe we can't do anything without him. Because all the profitability is with, it, is with the Lord. And that is the miracle of God's church, by the way. And that is how miracles take place in God's church. Not where profitable people believe they can do something for Jesus, but unprofitable people believe they can do nothing without Jesus. It's not enough to say it. We have to mean it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17. It says, second here, But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Now, does this mean at the end of the age, when you stand before the Lord, you will find you were completely unprofitable? Not at the end of the age. Because it is at the end of the age where God says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. But that's something we'll never ever truly know or understand till the end of the age. So in the here and now, 
it's absolutely important that we realize that only by Christ can anything profitable possibly happen. And that is the message. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you, I admit, Lord, there are some things that are hard to understand and some things that are hard to hear. Sometimes, Lord, even with me, it goes against the grain to realize that there's actually, if anything profitable happened where you received glory, I didn't do it. You did it. But I pray, Lord, because we do want to see your profitability in our lives. And we do want to see your miracles in the lives of others. We want to see this so that we know that you are God of all and that you can do all things. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. The song is, and it's really true, is 118, and that is, I need thee every hour. Let's stand 118. And not just some of the time. We need them all the time. Let's sing this song together. I need Savior, I come. 